Hi there everyone, welcome to our lesson on the water cycle, or as it's known in fancier circles, the hydrologic cycle. But don't worry about it boys and girls, we'll just call it the water cycle because it's a lot easier to do that. Alright, before we get started, I just want to show you or bring up a, just an interesting thought to help reinforce this whole cycle thing that the water goes through. Now here's a meme I found on the internet, and it's not one of those funny memes, but it's one of those kind of cool head scratcher memes where you read it and it really hits you and it kind of surprises you. Um, it's statistically at least one molecule of H2O out of every glass of water you ever drank once passed through a dinosaur. So that means the water that you've been drinking your whole entire life is millions and millions and millions of years old. This reinforces the idea that water isn't made or there is no brand new water that's made here on earth. The water is actually being cycled through different phases over time. So the water that you've been drinking has been around since the dinosaurs. All right, the water cycle is a process or a series of events rather where water changes forms and goes to different places. And the different types of things that we're gonna hit on are evaporation, transpiration, condensation, precipitation, surface runoff, storage, and infiltration. We'll touch on storage and infiltration a little bit, but we'll spend more time on the other phases of the water cycle. Now, as you guys know, the Earth is covered with water. 70% of the Earth's surface is covered in water. Uh, you take a look at a picture of the Earth, you just see blue because of the water in the oceans. So we have to get that water into the air somehow. Now, to get that water into the air, we have two different ways that we can use to get the water into the air. So let's talk about evaporation first. Now, evaporation is when liquid water, like water in the ocean, turns into a gas or water vapor. And how that happens is this. So here we have a basic drawing of just water in liquid form and water vapor. Uh, H2O is what water is. So we have H2, which are these two white atoms for hydrogen, and then we have the oxygen in the middle here. Now, when you take a look at water in liquid form, water is loosely bonded together. So here's your bonds here, and then these bonds would carry on over amongst every single water molecule here. Um, this explains why water isn't as light or feels like nothing as if we were walking through the water vapor in the air, but it's not as solid as if you were walking into a big huge chunk of ice. In liquid form, the water molecules are loosely bonded together, so that's why you have that liquid phase for water. But as we know, if it rains outside and it gets wet, the sun comes out, and soon, right afterwards, the water starts to evaporate. It starts to disappear and the ground starts to dry. And the reason being is the, the radiation, as we learned in our last section on energy transfer, radiation from the sun is actually going to break the bonds of the water. And as they break the bonds, the water molecules begin to get absorbed into the atmosphere. They move up into the atmosphere. And this is where they turn into vapor form when they're by themselves. So loosely bonded together, they form water. And when that bond's broken, that's going to then cause them to be water vapor. You can actually see a picture of that water vapor rising and, kind of, and also condensing. But this gives you the idea that the water vapor is escaping from the surface of the water. So here we have this pond here, or lake rather, and it's probably morning, sunrise, and you can see the water vapor rising into the atmosphere here. It's condensing, so that's how you're able to see it, but throughout the course of the day, you wouldn't see this mist or this fog, but this is just to show you that water vapor is trying to escape and go up into the atmosphere. Now, the second way water vapor gets into the atmosphere is through the process of transpiration. And transpiration is caused by trees and other plants on the Earth's surface. As we learned last year in seventh grade life science, all living things carry out cell respiration, and as a result, they make water vapor as a waste product. So plants do the same thing. As they make energy, ATP energy, they, re they create water vapor as a waste product, and they release it through those holes in the leaves called stoma, and then that water vapor then moves up into the atmosphere. Those are the two ways that our atmosphere gets loaded with water vapor. And then as that water vapor rises into the atmosphere, okay, it's going to cool and condense as we learn when we talk about convection. So as we learn in convection and density 
as air cools down, the air gets more compact or it gets more packed with air molecules. And as that happens, the water vapor molecules represented by these structures here kind of get squeezed out of the air. But what they tend to do, since water loves to stick to everything, is they'll bond onto dust particles floating in the air. And as a result, these water molecules are going to become attracted to this dust particle and bond to it. And the water molecules are going to stick to each other. And as a result, we're going to start to form these water droplets. So you have in condensation, water vapor molecules sticking to what's called a condensation nuclei, which is usually dust. And all the water vapor molecules around the area are going to stick to one another, creating these droplets. So in condensation, we're going from water vapor to liquid water again. It's the opposite of evaporation. So when this process happens, this explains why we have clouds all over the place. Okay, Clouds are just big, huge bodies of liquid water droplets that collect in the sky because of the process of condensation. All right, So that's what condensation is. Now, as we were just talking about, the clouds being filled with liquid water droplets, they're going to bump into each other. And as you know, when one water droplet falls into another water droplet, you get a bigger water droplet. Well, the air is going to blow these things around. These water droplets are going to move and they're going to get bigger and bigger until they get too heavy. And that's when they become precipitation. Precipitation occurs when water falls back down to the surface of the earth. Now, precipitation can take various forms. Here we have four illustrated for us. Up here in the upper left, we have rain, which is liquid water. And then we have snow, which is when the water vapor actually instantly crystallizes into ice and creates these snowflakes. And when they get big enough, they fall down to the surface of the earth. And as long as the air is below freezing, those flakes will make it to the surface. However, what will happen is sometimes liquid water will form at the upper parts of our atmosphere and fall through the atmosphere coming down to the surface of the earth and if that liquid water hits a pocket of freezing air that water will then freeze and this is what sleet is and then we have these things called hailstones hailstones are formed by thunderstorm clouds cumulonimbus clouds because of the big winds and updrafts so water vapor or liquid water droplets are constantly being blown back up into the atmosphere in freezing cold conditions. So they freeze, fall down, collect more water, and these updrafts blow it back up again. So every time it gets passed up and then falls down, it collects a new layer of water that freezes, and you can get these stones that could be golf ball size or even up to softball sizes. So these are our four types of precip that we can have, rain, snow, sleet, and hail. Now, when that water falls back down to earth, there's a couple of things that can happen to it. If it's cold enough up in like the mountains and in Arctic regions, you can have that snow just stay on the ground and it'll be stored in these bodies of ice called glaciers. However, if they fall into areas where they're a little bit warmer, we know that that snow is going to melt. Or if the season turns where the air is no longer freezing and it's warm, the snow melt is going to create liquid water and it's going to do what we call runoff. Surface runoff is when water moves across the surface of the earth back into a body of water. So it can go into streams and then these streams can feed into bigger rivers and then these rivers can feed into bigger bodies of water like a lake or we can go into oceans. So surface runoff is when water moves across the surface and then feeds back into a bigger body of water. Now, you've probably seen something like surface runoff on a rainy day. If you've ever been walking down the street or been caught out in the rain, you'll notice where the street meets the curb, you'll see these rivers of water running downhill going into these sewer drains. That's what surface runoff is. It's moving water going across the Earth's surface. Now, that's one thing that can happen when water returns. We can also have water infiltrate the ground, and that's called infi infiltration when the ground absorbs it. Our ground is like a sponge, and you've probably realized this on days where you've walked on a wet, muddy field, and every time you step down, you heard like a squishing noise and water come out of the ground. Okay, what will happen is the water will infiltrate or trickle down through the spaces between the soil grains and fill up this underground body of water called an aquifer. And these aquifers will feed back into the oceans and lakes and ponds in the area. And then you can just have water just be stored back into these bodies of water or evaporate straight away back into the water cycle. So let's just review what happens in the water cycle before we call this a day. 
water, liquid water, gets evaporated and turned into a gas through the process of, of evaporation, or transpiration lets that water vapor gas back into the atmosphere. Then, as that water vapor rises into the atmosphere and cools, it'll condense, forming water droplets. And once those water droplets get too heavy, because they bump into each other and they collide and they get bigger and bigger, once they get too heavy, they fall back to earth in the form of rain, snow, sleet, or hail. And that precipitation, which is what they are, can either be stored as ice and snow, it can be stored as liquid water, or it can run across the Earth's surface back into bodies of water. Or lastly, we can actually have the water go into the ground and infiltrate the ground and soak and fill up the ground. And this cycle repeats itself over and over again. And this is why every glass of water that you have statistically has at least one molecule of water that's passed through a dinosaur at one point. All right, folks, I hope you found this helpful. Have a good day.